Our distinguished guest today is Professor Zoltan Center, Professor in the Department of Constitutional and Administrative Law at the Center for Social Sciences at the Institute of Legal Sciences at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. I have to say that I am very excited today because uh, the subject is very in, in the very center at the very heart uh, of my field of interest, and I think that uh, you may feel uh, the same. Brussels Center will deliver a lecture entitled Dismantling the Rule of Law in Hungary and Poland, Similarities and Differences. In addition to the issues identified in the very title, during his speech, he will discuss the issues of basic principles and standards of rule of law, the decline of the rule of law, relevant theories and analytical frameworks in such a discussion, and possible future actions to restore the rule of law. Lecture will last about one hour and half, and then we'll have 30 minutes for a discussion. I know because I saw the presentation before that it will be an amazing journey. So not to prolong, turn off your mobile phones, fasten your seatbelts, and welcome Brussels Open Center with applause. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Zoltan Center. And uh, first of all, let me have some some words about myself. I'm a constitutional lawyer, and uh, um, my field of interest covers a lot of topics and areas of constitutional law. You can see here my books, uh, and, and not all of them, but, but maybe the most important of them. The last four uh, is uh, are, are in English. Um, my field of interest covers uh, mainly the European constitutional history, um, constitutional theory and comparative constitutional law. So the topic of my today's presentation falls within the, this last category, that is uh, the uh, uh, state of the rule of law in Poland and, uh, and Hungary. Um, I think that this topic is very updated and it uh, hardly needs a further justification. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I don't want to, to give you uh, an in-depth analysis of, of the state of, of the rule of law in these two countries, uh, because I, I guess that yeah, you are much more familiar with the Polish situation than, than myself. But I want just to, to give you a general picture of you, uh, uh, why these countries are so vehemently uh, criticized by the international organizations like the European Union and other, many other countries, and what kind of theor theoretical attempts have emerged to to describe and to to uh, explicate uh, the recent de constitutional development of these countries? So, uh, as as I said, I'm a constitutional lawyer, so everything what I I'm, I will say is or reflects uh, constitutional. Uh, low uh, approach. Um, I think that it's now no clear that the uh, democratic decay is a worldwide worldwide phenomenon, and certain authoritarian tendencies have emerged in our region. Uh, I mean, in Central Central Europe, in particular in Poland and and in in Hungary, um, posing serious challenge to the Western type constitutional uh, democracies. Uh, as it is well known, the uh, systematic backsliding of the rule of law in these two countries has attracted strong international uh, attention. Um, there's a vast and, and growing uh, academic literature, literature discussing the situation in these uh, uh, countries, and uh, some or maybe many international organizations like the World Bank, the uh, Freedom House, Transparency Inter International, Amnesty International, all have measured a significant deteriora deterioration of the level of democracy and the rule of law in both countries in, in recent years. Um, here you can see uh, the structure of my presentation today. Um, first, I believe that it needs some justification why these two countries can be discussed together, why they can be compared to each other. Nowadays, these countries are so frequently uh, discussed 
uh, together with such countries like Venezuela, Singapore, China, or Russia, which might be, and really it's quite surprising because those countries have quite different political and constitutional systems. So I will argue that we should, or you should, or we should be uh, very careful to, to make such comparisons with those countries. But at the same time, I will try to, to argue for the plausibility of, of comparing these two countries, that is Poland and, and Hungary. Then I, I, I will talk about the very general requirements of the rule of law, principles and standards of this uh, concept. I think that it is never useless to, to remind the, the audience of, of the basic values and requirements of the rule of law, uh, in particular because, at least it is my personal experience, that more and more politicians, uh, mainly populists, uh, argue so that rule of law is something very abstract and general notion without particular contents. So it, it, it maybe it, it is useful to 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 talk about quite shortly anyway the basic requirements of the rule of law at both both at uh, European and national levels. After that, I'd like to explain why these two countries are criticized by the international actors um, or international community, um, and then a, a, a literature review will follow. So. Um, presenting the most important theoretical attempts to, to, to explain what's going on in these countries, including the most important uh, uh, academic debates or controversies in, in uh, present-day mainstream constitutional scholarship. So, um, uh, well, uh, and, and maybe the, uh, the last part of, of my lecture will be the uh, most subjective part about what next, because nobody can foresee or even uh, the, the, the near future, but my interest is to, to think about how the, uh, how the rule of law could be restored in, in these countries, and I will try to, to show you some Hungarian uh, attempts what to do, which might be interesting for, for, for you, most of, them, most of them are Polish as, as, I, as I know. Okay, but, uh, let me start invoking uh, a very short and recent and, and a little bit funny story from, from Hungary. A couple of weeks ago, the Hungarian government introduced a new tax in, in Hungary, uh, imposed on imposed in certain economic areas the, the name of this new tax is a uh, excess or extra profit tax in telecommunication energy sector the uh, tax has been imposed on uh, certain companies in uh, in, uh, 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 in bank sector and other financial enterprises and airways uh, airways, corporations, or companies. Um, do you know who is this man? Right. <laughs> yeah, he is Michael O'Leary. He is the CEO of the Ryanair. Uh, uh, Ryanair is one of the biggest uh, discount uh, airway, airways company. And um, uh, you know, when, uh, actually, the justification of this new tax was that during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, almost everybody has losses. Nevertheless, uh, certain economic enterprises acquired extra profits. And that, that is, that's why it would be justified to request them to contribute more to, to public burdens. So that was the official justification of uh, uh, imposing this new tax. But Ryanair Im immediately announced that it would pass the tax on on uh, to the passengers of Ryanair, which means that they will increase the prices of their airline tickets. So, and Land Lounge, anyway, a very active communication communication campaign 
against the government, which is completely new in, in, in that country. You know, it's quite, quite unusual because anyway, the government itself used to campaign against somebody else. Uh, okay, so um, Michael O'Leary, this man, uh, has repeatedly said that the economic minister, he, he, this man is Hungarian economic minister, uh, Martin Knight is an idiot. <laughs> Because um, he announced and explained the reasons of this uh, this new tax, as as uh, told uh, uh, before uh, earlier, and said that these two Hungarian ministers, the other mi guy is the minister uh, leading the uh, prime minister's office in ministerial rank, that these uh, these two Hungarian ministers are like dumb and dumber. If they think people will happily pay the extra tax and choose a more expensive airline uh, overnight. And Ryanair passengers have received a letter from Ryanair encouraging them to send protest letters to, uh, to, the, to these ministers with the same text. We Hungarian people and our families will now be forced to pay this unjustified tax because of your greed and stupidity. So, so it, it's, it's, it's quite funny um, story, but I believe that it's even, even more interesting, the, the background from, from a rule of law perspective, uh, which explains the, the angry of, of Mr. <laughs> Valeri. Uh, so uh, and, uh, the, the whole story I, I, I want to, to invoke is because it very well illustrates what's going on in Hungary uh, on these days, and it illuminates the state of the rule of law right now. So just let me mention some, some uh, rule of law problems in, in, this, in, this, sorry, in this story. The, 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 the first problem is that, in fact, just precisely because of the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the discount airways companies have suffered an extra loss rather than extra profit. So actually, or in fact, there is no any extra profit which could be or should be taxed by, by any, any government. The second problem is that this new tax is badly discriminatory in nature. For example, there are certain economic areas and activities which have uh, generated really, really extra profits. For example, in building industry, in gambling industry, in tourism. But there's an, an extremely important difference. On those areas, the so-called Hungarian uh, oligarchs are working, you know, which, who, who are close allies of, of the prime minister and the Fidesz, the major Hungarian gov governing party. But still, or therefore, this is a, a greatly discriminatory uh, 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 tax. The next rule of law problem, or if we approach uh, the whole problem from a rule of law perspective, is that there is no any legal or constitutional control over the taxation of the central government because the Consti Hungarian constitutional court simply doesn't have any power to review the constitutionality of public finance legislation. So this, this power uh, was deprived uh, of uh, uh, the uh, constitutional court a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and the last problem is that uh, the, the minister, Martin Knight, uh, immediately after this controversy, launched a customer protection investigation against Ryanair, which is, again, an awful action, you know, because there is no any legal basis for such an investigation, but he instructed the, the uh, competent agency to, to launch uh, a customer protection uh, procedure because, you know, in the market uh, economy, the uh, uh, corporations are or should be completely free how to set their own prices towards the, the customers. Okay, so let's move to, 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 to the, I don't know, first or second point, similarities and differences between the Hungarian and the Polish situations. I think that um, uh, um, there are many similarities between, the two, between these two countries. Uh, firstly, because they have quite similar uh, political and constitutional history. 
you all all you know that uh, uh, after the uh, after the Second World War, both countries got under the uh, uh, Soviet occupation and they were enforced to establish a communist type or Soviet type uh, regimes, uh, including legal, uh, Soviet type legal and constitutional uh, systems. And after that, therefore, after the fall of, of the communist regimes, these both countries made the fastest, maybe the fastest democratic transitions. They were the, the champions of the democratization process and they were front runners of joining the European Union and, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, actually, uh, and simultaneously they joined in, in, in the same time together with some other countries, uh, the uh, European Union in 2004. Uh, and uh, however, they were also the pioneers of dismantling the rule of law and the Western type constitutional uh, uh, democracy after that in Hungary, Fidesz came to power in um, 2010 and the PIS, the Law and Justice Party in uh, uh, 2015. Um, both countries are governed by populist parties. It's quite spread, uh, quite usual um, qualification or characterization of these, these uh, 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 governments. It is very interesting that both parties, I mean Fidesz and the uh, Law and Justice Party, uh, were uh, or had been in government for a short period beforehand. The Fidesz between 1998 and 2002, and uh, the PIS between 2005 and 2007, and they were uh, originally uh, right-wing uh, moderate conservative parties, but they couldn't consolidate their parties in those uh, times. So while they were uh, initi in initially moderate right conservative right-wing parties, after coming to power again, they started to, to become uh, more and more extreme right and, and, and populist uh, 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 parties. So, um, um, an, another another similarity is uh, uh, illiberal uh, internal or inner policy in both countries. A specific form of populism, the nationalist populism, is quite uh, uh, frequently discussed phenomenon in in political science literature uh, nowadays. And these countries, only in these two countries, have populist parties been able to 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 achieve real institutional and constitutional changes uh, dismantling the institutional system of checks and balances following um, more or less uh, similar uh, 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 ideology i mean a conservative uh, 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 christian ideology although in central and eastern europe uh, populists came to power in some other countries, including Austria, uh, Czechia, uh, Slovakia, or even Slovenia. Um, only in Hungary and Poland have they been able to institutionalize uh, semi-authoritarian political and constitutional system through legal reforms and constitutional formal in Hungary and informal in Poland constitutional uh, changes. Um, anyway, misusing the uh, very well admitted Western type institutions like multi party parliaments or constitutional courts, local authorities, and so on and so on. Um, at the same time, yeah, I said, okay, at the same time, yes, EU skepticism is another characteristic for, for both those uh, uh, countries. At the same time, certainly there are certain uh, uh, differences. While I don't know, it, it, I, it's up to your, your own uh, evaluation, but I'm sure that the, the opposition is much stronger in this country than in, hung, in Hungary. In Hungary, there is an extremely fragmented, weak, and let's say opportunistic uh, opposition, which, which is uh, not so surprising after a, a great loss or um, uh, in, in the last general elections in this, this April. Or let, let me have another example. As far as I know, in this country, 
judges sometimes uh, have public demonstrations protesting against the judicial reform of the government. It, it is quite unimaginable in Hungary that the, the judges just try to, to hide themselves. Uh, uh, okay, so this this is my 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 basic point that why in Hungary there's an extremely weak uh, opposition. Maybe uh, there's a stronger parliamentary and extra parliamentary opposition here in this country. Another very essential difference is that while in Hungary Fidesz has had almost continuously a two-thirds parliamentary majority, which means a constitution-making majority, uh, there was only a short interruption, a break uh, between uh, 2015 and 18. But, but uh, since 2010, Fidesz has had almost continuously, as I said, um, constitution-making majority, which is reflected by the real constitutional changes in Hungary. You know, the uh, new Hungarian constitution, let's say Fidesz constitution, because only the Fidesz MPs uh, voted for the new constitution named fundamental law in 2011, uh, entering into effect on uh, the January 1st of next year, I mean uh, 2012. You know, since then, there have been no less than 11 constitutional amendments. Just because the governing party has a constitution making majority, it can do whatever it wants to do uh, in, in the constitution. Why, uh, but in, in, in Poland, the, the government coalition or the governing party doesn't have a uh, constitution making majority, so it has to 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 use some other kind of of instruments if it wants to to make uh, constitutional changes and as I, as far as i know pis has uh, really or real ambitions to to achieve constitutional changes a uh, party different constitutional reforms um yes um, for example i i mean that while in uh, this country there is a very rigid abortion regulation, even though uh, it it uh, comes from the, the uh, last uh, ruling of the Constitutional Tribunal, this I mean this K120 uh, judgment of the Constitutional tri tri Tribunal. Uh, in Hungary, there are some um, uh, some other constitutional problems, mainly the uh, the rude restrictions of academic freedom uh, maybe you you have you have heard something about the uh, persecution of the central european university from budapest to to Wien, just against Hungary, even the fundamental law just against uh, or against the european law as the uh, european court of justice has uh, judged it uh, okay is there any yes level of corruption i i've heard some corruption scandals and problems from Poland as well, but I'm quite uncertain, but I'm sure that there's a systematic corruption in Hungary. Sorry for, for these more pictures, but I just want to show you this. this uh, he is uh, Viktor Orban, the prime minister, and the, and the other guy is uh, Istvan Tibor. He's a son-in-law of the prime minister. Today, although he is a very young and he was a beginner in in the business life, but today he is one of the the richest men in 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 Hungary. Uh, the the other guy is another oligarch, let's like say a typhoon. is is uh, the father of Mr. Orban, uh, and the last one is uh, the richest Hungarian today, Lorenz Mészáros. He was originally a plumber, a gasman in a small village. Later on, he was the, the mayor of of uh, of uh, the birthplace of the prime minister, <laughs> and today he is the uh, the uh, standing permanent winner of any public procurement uh, uh, procedure. So uh, and he uh, anyway he was the schoolmate of Mr. Orban. So there was a, a famous manifesto or or, or sentence of 
learning me such that I'm grateful for my 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 richness to to God and to Mr. Orban. So that was very, very symbolic. Yeah, and I mentioned foreign policy. While uh, Poland, I I I mean, there's a tensions uh, relationship with Russia. So there is no so uh, good relationship. There is a good personal relationship between Mr. Putin and Mr. Orban. Some journalists uh, try to to explore what could be the the original reason for this friendship. Um, and this, uh, yeah, okay, this again symbol. Mr. Sergei Lavrov, the uh, Russian foreign minister, honors uh, the Hungarian. Uh, uh, foreign minister Peter Siato. That's the maybe, uh, uh, as far as I know, this is the highest Russian honor which can be given to to a foreigner. That's for for friendship. Friendship. Okay. Well, move just moving to to the next uh, uh, subtopic: the uh, requirements and principles of the rule of law. This lady is a Hungarian minister of justice. Judith Varga, and I cut or I, I wanted to show you some citations from her different speeches and sentences. Uh, you, you can see that these are, I would say that she she so often tries to put the rule of law or the value of the rule of law in, in question, saying such things like, like this. This man is maybe more interesting. He is uh, András Varga G. Right now, he he is the uh, president of the Supreme Court of Hungary. The uh, unique it is quite unique case because just before his election, he never been an ordinary judge for a moment. So he he never been. He was a member of the Constitution Court, extremely loyal to, 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 to the government. So that's why, and, and there was a, a, it's a constitutional law terminology, a personalized legislation. So uh, a new tax was adopted, um, um, uh, tailored to, to his own person, saying that the ex members of the Constitutional Court may ask may ask the president of republic to 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 appoint them a judge an ordinary judge so but he just immediately jumped into to the position of the president of the of the supreme court uh, and he here you you can see some quite similar uh, uh citations from him anyway he uh wrote uh, a book about the rule of law as an idol, that it's, it is something, some uh, a, a, a kind of exaggerated value, which or, or we shouldn't respect this so much, and so on, and so on. Uh, anyway, his book uh, uh, is available in English, but I wouldn't recommend you to, to read that book. Okay, so uh, if, if we just Take a look at these sentences, these citations. They are quite shocking for me because the rule of law uh, um, is, is a very basic principle of, of the whole Hungarian constitutional system. So actually, the, the self-definition of the Hungarian state is built on, among others, on this principle, as you can see, the Hungarian fundamental law defines Hungary as a state that Hungary shall be an independent democratic rule of law state. There's a quite similar provision in the uh, in uh, 1997 Polish constitution, the Republic of Poland shall be a democratic state ruled by law. So it's an extremely strange thing to, to hear under such circumstances that rule of law is idol. It doesn't have any particular content, and so on, uh, and so on, uh, and so on. I don't want to go into details, uh, but the, um, in fact, the rule of law has 
principle has been operationalized by not only by legislation, but by the constitutional court. And as far as I know, there is a rich and and uh, specific specific jurisprudence of the constitutional uh, Polish constitutional tri tribunal from some some years years ago. So you can see here the very general constitutional principles, but you know it is like a pyramid where the, the rule of the principle of rule of law is at the peak of the whole pyramid, and there are at different levels of abstraction, some sub principles of rule of law, like, like legal certainty. Uh, on 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 the uh, on the bottom, you can see how it is defined by or has been defined by the constitutional courts, jurisprudence, legal certainty, neural criminal signal league, and and, and and so on and so on. So uh, I can say that both constitutional courts have elaborated uh, in the past a very rich uh, um, and detailed jurisprudence. Uh, that's quite similar uh, situation at European level. As you know, the rule of law is uh, declared by, as, as one of the basic values of the whole Union, whole U European Union in Article 2. But it, it is working principle in the, in the uh, uh, EU, in, in the working mechanism of the European Union from many uh, aspects. And, uh, Yes, yes, maybe the, the most general definition of the rule of law, at least uh, at European level, is that under the rule of law, all public powers must be exercised within the constraints settled by law in accordance with the values of democracy and the fundamental rights and under the control of independent and impartial courts. So that's the very abstract, most abstract definition of the rule of law at the European uh, level. And the, uh, according to, to the EU law, uh, rule of law includes principles like legality, transparent and accountability, lawmaking processes, legal certainty, prohibition of uh, the arbitrary exercise of uh, executive power, respect for human rights, um, effective judicial protection, separation of powers, equality before the law, freedom of expression, and so on, and, 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 and so on. Notably, uh, or there is a new phenomenon at the European level. I will uh, uh, um, talk about this new, new process, but right now, let me refer to the annual reports prepared by the European Commission about the, the state of the rule of law in each member, member state. And there is a summary report about the whole picture. Uh, and according, uh, and there's a, a very uh, interesting structure of these reports. These reports are based on four pillars. So we could conclude that in, in according to, to, the, the, to the European Commission, at least, these are the, the major principles or pillars of the rule of law, uh, which are the uh, justice systems, that is the uh, judicial level uh, of the, uh, judicial independence, anti-corruption measures, media pluralism, actually freedom of expression, and other uh, separation of powers issues or checks and balances issues. But it would be a little bit uh, misleading, I think, because the European Union and the, U the EU institutions are, are exploring the state of the rule of law in the member state, states as long as the EU funds are affected, not beyond that point. So that, therefore, it is an institutional approach and not, not a real, real approach, maybe. But it is even more important, maybe, that these uh, basic values of the European Union are protect or have institutional protections, uh, protection within the, the EU institutional system. Um, actually, there are three, but actually there are four because the uh, uh, so-called Article 7 procedure ha itself has two different uh, uh, consecutive, consecutive uh, proceedings. The first uh, procedure is sometimes it is called nuclear 
option because the possible uh, sanction is is very bad or would be very bad. That's why it, it will never be used in, in reality. The uh, essence of the uh, Article 7 procedure is um, that the first in the first stage, uh, the whole procedure aims at identifying whether or not there is a clear risk of serious breach of the rule of law in a member country of the European Union. If it is or if it would be the case in a member country, uh, another a second or consecutive procedure would follow, aiming at uh, set, setting a sanction, a real sanction. See, real sanction could be um, introduced by the Council, suspending the right, the veto right, uh, voting right of the affected country. So that's the nuclear option because many people think that it would be a, an extremely serious sanction. Um, in December um, 2017, that was the first uh, first uh, case in the history of the whole European Union, the European Commission triggered Article 7 procedure for the first time in relation to Polish judicial uh, reform, because in the view of the Commission, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, this reform or these measures removed the, uh, the or or weakened the separation of powers between the, the executive and and judicial branch or judiciary. Uh, ne next year in September 2018, the European Parliament voted for action against Hungary because of or alleging a systematic breach breaches of of core EU values, in particular the rule of. Hello. So these are ongoing uh, procedures, but I, I I don't think that there will be any real uh, real uh, yeah. result of these procedures. The next one is the so-called rule of law mechanism introduced two years ago, um, which provides a process for, according to the official language of the EU, an, an annual dialogue between the European Union. Uh, and the member states in order to monitor and to promote the state of the rule of law in in the uh, in, uh, in member countries. The whole procedure is based on the annual report reports of the uh, uh, European Commission about the uh, the state of of the rule of law in each member member state. Um, um, and this this mechanism has been working since 2020. And the last one, and maybe the most effective instrument in the hands of the European Union is the so-called conditionality procedure, which is uh, the youngest, very fresh uh, uh, instrument, which uh, this so-called conditionality regime allows the EU to, to, to withdraw the uh, EU payments, that's payments from the EU fund towards the member states in case of the systematic breaches of the rule of law. Um, and so far, there has been uh, there have been problems only in two cases. Which countries? With which countries? Poland and Hungary, uh, where the uh, so these countries have haven't received their share from the recovery fund of the European Union, but since then, as far as I know, there has been agreement between the European Commission and the Polish government, even though under very spe specific and unusual conditions. Um, so, um, well, I think that it's uh, time to move to to next uh, next point. That is the decline of the system of the rule of law in the, from a comparative perspective. Um, certainly, I will concentrate rather on because I, I guess you are familiar with the Polish situation. Um, paradox. So I think that it's a real paradox that, as I said earlier, these two countries were the front runners of the democratization process when the uh, communist system collapsed in the turn of 1980s and 1990s. Um, 
uh, and, uh, and, and champions of the new EU accession, but uh, the uh, dismantling of the rule of law began in just in, in, in these two countries and has been the, the deepest, deepest one. So if we look at the uh, applied techniques of destroying or dismantling the system of the rule of law, um, basically we can uh, 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 say some similarities and dif differences again, but I believe that similarities are much more important and great, great, greater than, than differences. And um, so I don't want to go into details, but, but it is striking, at least for me, that there are some that that um, there's a very similar structure of destroying the rule of law in these two countries, and the, the individual uh, events or or developments can be classified into two or or three uh, three uh, groups, um, distinguishing those legal acts or policy measures which. Uh, um, uh, which were intended to to break down the institutional system of of the separation of powers and those steps and measures which which restricted certain fundamental rights or discriminated certain minority groups. The first group of the rule of law violations uh, uh, neutralized or weakened the the so-called countervailing and control institutions. Countervailing institutions are those public authorities whose primary function is to control, to check, or counterbalance the executive and legislative power. The common feature of these public authorities is that they do not or they should not de uh, decide their own issues on a political basis. So these are or should be non-political uh, public authorities, which means that they should ground their decisions on non-political considerations, but rather on professional considerations, professional aspects, constitutionality, legality, administrative justice, and so on, and so on. Mainly the constitutional courts, ordinary courts, election committees, ombudsman, and, and such uh, other uh, prosecution services could be classified into the uh, group of of the countervailing institutions. Um, I believe that despite uh, a very spread view in political science literature, these regimes are not anti-institutionalists at all. So it is a recurrent claim in political science that the populists, Hungarian and Polish populists, are anti-institutionalists because they want to destroy these institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But my, my, uh, I'm convinced that they are not. So, for example, during the constitution-making process in 2011, Fidesz could have abolished the constitution court if it wanted to do so. But, but no, rather, I believe that these populist parties or governments try to put these institutions at their own service. So they do not want to abolish them. They want to put them under direct political control. They want to subvert these institutions and they want to use these institutions for their own purposes rather than destroying them uh, absolutely. Okay. So, um, so what, what's uh, a, maybe it, it is also interest, or maybe interest that not only the non-political institutions, but the political institutions have been uh, have been put under direct political control, have been neutralized. For example, uh, just because these systems, these regimes are extremely, let's say, majority. Maybe you, 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 you know this, this term, term, majoritarian, which means that the governing parties consider that their uh, election victory uh, gives them a uh, whole mandate to do, do anything, what, what is an unlimited power, unlimited uh, mandate. 
and uh, the will of the majority certainly represented by themselves themselves uh, um, uh, cannot be opposed by any other institution or, or, or people. So that's why, according to this approach, even parliament cannot uh, obstacle the governmental will, the majority will, but parliament is only an instrument to, 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 to legitimize the governmental will, and this is basically the function of the new function of the constitutional court or the constitutional tribunal to give legitimacy, legal or constitutional legitimacy to all governmental uh, governmental actions. So, so that's why the parliaments in both countries, I'm maybe I'm risky, but I, I would say that even in, in Poland, these are actually rubber stamp parliaments only which means that they automatically consent any initiative of the, of the central government. It is interesting as well that the, um, the special kind of politicization uh, uh, affects the executive agencies as well, which means that political aspirations always takes precedence over, over professional considerations uh, and uh, that the uh, the uh, leading positions are filled by political appointees rather than prof real professionals. The other group contains rights restrictions and discrimination against certain minority rights. Uh, the situation is partly different in the two countries, I, I believe. So um, I referred earlier to the uh, very rude uh, restriction of abortion rights in, in this country. It's not the case yet in, in, in Hungary. Why in Hungary, some other 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 basic fundamental rights are seriously limited, like freedom of speech or 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 private or uh, freedom of religion. For example, ten years ago, more than three hundred uh, religious communities were deprived of their church status, which is uh, a protect, legally protected uh, legal status. Okay, so, or, or as, as I referred to also to you earlier, the, uh, the uh, academic freedom is under threat in, in, in Hungary. For example, where the, um, uh, the, uh, on the introduction was said that my institute belongs to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, it is not the case anymore. So uh, three years ago, the all research institutions have been uh, were taken away from the academy and putting them under the uh, um, the uh, subordination of, of the central government. Fortunately, at the moment there is no any any uh, political pressure on these institutions. So what I'm saying that is really my, my own opinion. It is not a, an official or governmental position, but maybe you realized uh, that so far. Yes, so after both Fidesz and, and PIS came to power, the first the first thing they tried to, to do was to leave the uh, independence of the Constitutional Court and Constitutional Tribunal, respectively. Um, yeah, packing the Constitutional Court, uh, if you are interested to know more about it, uh, I guess that you 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 know what what's what happened with the uh, uh, Polish Constitutional Tribunal. But there, the, the Hungarian government applied quite different instruments to subvert the Constitutional Court. Um, exchanges have affected both the uh, position. And and the power of the constitutional court. So the first, maybe uh, the first step in Hungary, in order to change the composition of the constitutional court, was that the way of the nomination system, and, and just just it, it it's important, you know, to, to to notice the the very concrete and particular instruments ways how to subvert originally independent institution, but put it under the direct political control. So the very first step was to change the nomination system of the constitutional judges. 
Before that was the system, there was a parliamentary committee to, 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 to nominate the future members of the court based on the parity principle. Parity means that uh, government and opposition MPs are in, this, in, in an equal number in, in the parliamentary committee. So that was the very simple rule, which enforced the parties to get a compromise. A political compromise, okay, but a compromise was needed. But after the reform, uh, the composition of the, the relevant parliament was changed in a way that today this committee, the composition, reflects the uh, uh, party relationships in the whole parliament, which means that even in the parliamentary committee, the governing parties have a two-thirds majority. So there is no any need for compromise anymore. Okay, it means in in reality that since 2016, only the uh, government or government uh, uh, nominees candidates uh, uh, have got to to the court. You know, so today, Hungarian Constitutional Court composed uh, only of of the, of members. Uh, nominated by by Fidesz by by the government party. Uh, another um, change was the number of judges was increased from eleven to fifteen. You know the, the the real reason for this change was that the the old justices the the uh, mandate of the old justices haven't terminated. Uh, when Fidesz came to power. That's why the old, old and independent or or, comprom or, or the uh, two-party, let's say, two-party compro compromise, uh, compromise uh, judges uh, sit in, 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 in the bench. So new uh, newcomers uh, should or, or was or were uh, sent to, to, to the Constitutional Court. In this way, establishing the majority of the governing party, and the, the, the term of office of constitutional judges were prolonged or have been prolonged from nine to twelve uh, years. Uh, government majority uh, in a court for a long, from time of from a uh, long period of time, and finally, the president of the court is today elected by parliament. Earlier, it was elected by by the or by the constitutional judges from themselves. As to the powers of the constitutional court, public finance legislation is uh, mostly exempted from constitutional review. I referred to it uh, a little bit earlier. So the constitutional court simply doesn't have any power to review any public finance legislation, laws of taxes, customs, budgetary issues, and so on and so on. Uh, the actio so-called actio popularis was annulled. I don't know whether you, you know what is actio popularis. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it uh, allowed um, an access to the constitutional court for for everybody. So every citizen or organization may uh, petitioned uh, or may submitted a petition to the court asking the court to review the legislation without any personal interests. So that was uh, a new and today only government, head of state may lodge a petition uh, 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 before the constitutional court. Then some court decisions were overruled by constitutional amendment. So don't allow any politician or political party a constitution making majority because that will be the result. It, it means that in, after 2010, after that Fidesz came to power, in the first two or three years, the constitution court still adhered to a new, some new legislation, you know. But Mr. Orban is very angry for, for, his, for this rebel. And uh, some constitutional amendments have been or were adopted to overrule the constitutional court judgments. That was a very simple uh, procedure or very simple solution to the constitutional concerns 
if the Constitutional Court said that this law is badly unconstitutional, that's right, okay, the text of this law we will inscribe into the Constitutional text, and there is no any Constitutional review over this, this subject anymore. You know, so that was the, the current uh, 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 method of, of, of uh, this government. And that was the final blow at the independence of the Constitutional Court. All, all Constitutional Court decisions taken before the new fundamental law have, uh, were uh, annulled, were abolished by, by a constitutional amendment. In Poland, as you know, the new said, oh, oh, I don't want to go into details, so, uh, but I'm, I, I read uh, so much about how uh, replaced the old, old members of, of the Constitutional Tribunal uh, with, with new ones, and it was extremely, maybe it is, it would be in, unimaginable, even in Hungary, what took place here, that the government uh, wasn't willing to, to publish a constitutional, an unfavorable constitutional tribunal's decision, but it was very, it was very interesting indeed. The next target was the judiciary, uh, using a little bit similar, but at the same time, time different uh, instruments to replace uh, uh, some, maybe Poland tried to follow the Hungarian example to an extent, but as far as I know this uh, technique that I mean that um, uh, uh, dismissing certain judges by lowering the uh, uh, retirement age of judges was applies maybe here only Supreme Court for Supreme Court judges. In Hungary, this technique was used for all uh, Hungarian judges, which meant that in, in 2012, uh, within a year, within only one year, about 10% of all acting judges were removed from their positions. Uh, lowering the uh, uh, compulsory retirement age from 70 to 62. So that was a, a, a what was interesting that even by Hungarian court, this legislation was uh, declared uh, null and void. So they repealed this this law. The European Court of Justice said that it badly violates the European law. Okay, what do you mean? What what happened after these decisions? Nothing. Although uh, almost 300 judges were dismissed from their positions, no one of them were repositioned. Uh, so uh, putting them back into their earlier positions, but they got some payments from the government. So, and and, uh, and the story continued. Okay. Yeah, premature removal of the chief judge. Uh, as far as I know, there was an unsuccessful attempt here, removing the president uh, of the Supreme Court. In Hungary, that was a success, successful story from the point of view of the government. So Mr. Andras Baka, who was the, uh, the president of the uh, Supreme Court uh, 10 years ago, he dared to criticize the judicial reform of the Hungarian government, therefore, by adopting a new constitutional amendment. The uh, technique was very interesting, not, not to, to follow it, but the technique was very simple. You know, a constitutional amendment renamed the, the Supreme Court. So today, the name, the official name of the Supreme Court is Curia. It's a traditional old name of the Supreme Court. Nothing else has, has changed. But it was enough for, for the government or for the constitution making power to say that, okay, so in this case, the, uh, the, the old president of the Supreme Court, his mandate is not valid anymore because it is not the Supreme Court, it is Uriel. It's quite a completely different body and, and the, uh, the new parliamentary majority has a right to elect a new president for, for, the, for, for Uriel. 
as part of the Supreme Court. Okay. Um, yeah. In both countries, the uh, the system of the uh, central administration of judiciary um, has been changed, not in the same way, uh, because I believe that in this country, the sense of the or the core moment of this uh, judiciary reform was to re, re, the renewal of this body, um, uh, feeling feared by by new members uh, elected by the Senate. So that's the, let's say, political point, appointments. But while in Hungary, uh, the whole central administration was put in a newly established central office led by, <laughs> led by the wife of Mr. Josef Sayer, who escaped from my blood. You know? <laughs> it was a very funny moment. And, and but he, anyway, he, has a wife still, <laughs> and uh, this lady is uh, the old friend of the Orban family and, and the uh, the original Fidesz heroes, and so so that was in in this way political control over the central administration of judiciary uh, and political control of public media, which means public public media uh, has been also packed in uh, in all uh, in in both countries, and today. They are, at least in Hungary, surely um, media is is the uh, uh, simple propaganda instrument of, of the government. Well, still there are yes and anti LGBTQ campaigns and policies. I think of the uh, uh, no go zones or uh, in 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 this country, and there is a central. Uh, campaign uh, in in Hungary again, and uh, some constitutional amendments have tried to 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 strengthen these campaigns, saying, for example, the that the uh, father is a man, mother is a, or should be a, a woman, and so on, and so on. Still, there are some differences. Um, the first one is comes from. The original difference that in Hungary, the Fidesz has two thirds, that is constitution making majority, abusing the constitution, this power, I, I believe. So I just took a, a concrete example how to overrule the, the unfavorable constitution for decisions. Here in, in, uh, in Poland, uh, sometimes uh, maybe it is not a consensual terminology, but so-called statutory anti-constitutionalism, which means that just because the governing party doesn't have a constitution-making majority, it must use uh, quite alternative instruments to, to reach constitutional changes, for example, to reinterpret the constitutional provisions by simple legislation or using the constitutional tribunal. So, uh, to make new interpretation of old constitutional provisions. Um, special measures and speed of reforms. It is sometimes, or maybe often said, that Warsaw follows Budapest. That is, the, the Polish government follows the Hungarian example, what to do, how to consolidate our own powers, and so on, and so on. I don't know what, whether it is true or, or not, or maybe, to an extent, it is it is true because, as you can, could see, there are some similarities between the recent constitutional or legal changes in in these countries. And there is a very important difference between the two countries, as far as I know. Here hasn't been declared a constitutional state of emergency. Yeah, in Hungary, <laughs> yes. So in in Hungary, since March 2020. There has been continuously a uh, state of emergency, even though on a different legal basis. So, for example, when a couple of months ago, when the pandemic seemed to, to be seemed to decline, uh, the government uh, uh, invented a new reason for declaring a state of emergency, the war in a neighboring country. So that's the legal title today. 
And, uh, you know, actually the Hungarian government liked the uh, exceptional power. So it liked that they, they could govern by decrees, emergency decrees. So they, I would say, have reproduced the emerge, state of emergency, putting it at a sub-constitutional level. So, for example, there was a period when, in parallel, in Hungary, there were three different states of emergency. One constitutional state of emergency for handling crisis management because of the COVID-19. There was a sub-constitutional, I would say, quasi-emergency situation caused by mass migration, although no mig migrant wants to stay in Hungary, but okay. And the health emergency situation. So, so it, it, it was a very complicated system. The only thing what is sure is the exceptional power in the hands of the government. Okay, so if you have more energy, just let me uh, take a look at the uh, the very the most relevant and important uh, theoretical uh, directions or or theories. Uh, uh, which try to to describe and and explain the uh, 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 um, the state of rule of law in these two two countries. So uh, I said earlier that there's um, more or less a consensus in academic main, main, uh, mainstream academic literature that in these countries in Hungary since. 2010 in Poland uh, since 2015, um, populist governments have uh, uh, been in, in power. And uh, still, uh, there's a great variety of assessments or evaluations of these, or ex explanations of these situations. Um, uh, it is worth noting, however, that these theories are not completely interchangeable with each other. But still, there, there are some overlappings between them, some similar uh, criteria, and so on and so on. The uh, differences between these theories come, come from the fact that some of them try to, to uh, some of them relate to the political systems and political changes, others to constitutional polity, polities and constitutional or formal changes. And some theories, concentrate on, on the development, that is the, the whole process. Some others focus on a snapshot of that is the current situation of in, in these countries. The first uh, such very well spread um, theory says that these are hybrid, hybrid, so-called hybrid regimes. In political science is quite spread theory. Um, which suggests that these particular systems are in transition. They are somewhere at halfway between autocracy and democracy. Uh, they are not already Western type constitutional democracies, but still they are not pure autocracies or, or dictatorships. And then there's a, that's why are these regimes called hybrid systems. Uh, according to to this approach, you, you can see some well-known authors who, who use for, for this, uh, this theory. So according to this, this, um, this approach, due to some external constraints coming from the uh, uh, European Union or, Union or international community, uh, these regimes try to appear constitutional democracies, but they operate, uh, and, and they operate, they run formally democratic institutions and procedures, but they do not use, and, and they do not use physical physical force uh, for political gains. So hybrid reg regimes are often called competitive or electoral authoritarianism, which suggests that they are closer to an authoritarian than a democratic system which means, which phrase, for example, competitive authoritarianism means that 
that although um, ruling parties or the governments are willing to organize general elections regularly, um, but these are these elections are not fair and not free uh, because there is a playing tilt towards the governing parties and there is no real chance for the opposition to 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 topple the incumbent government. Um, well, the the other quite widespread theory is populist constitutionalism, maybe the most fashionable nowadays. Uh, uh, which basically uh, this theory suggests that populist parties, populist politicians establish a new and specific form of constitutionalism, which is populist constitutionalism. In, in other words, populism is not only a political movement style or ideology or whatever else, but it makes a very, or creates a very specific superstructure of constitutionalism, a new form of constitutionalism, which has very well identifiable features, so criteria, like concentration of, or centralization of power in the hand of a charismatic political leader. Or populists have um, a moral claim to represent the real interests of the people, I mean the ordinary or average people vis-a-vis -vis the elites. So there is, you know, it's like a Schmittian uh, uh, conception of power or political tensions, or they are allegedly, I mean, uh, the, the adherents of populist constitutionalism uh, say that these regimes are anti and the institutionalists, I referred to, to a little bit earlier, anti-pluralists, so they want to destroy the uh, any obstacle, institutional obstacles in the way of the governmental power, and so on, and so on. Um, many uh, commentators think that populist constitutionalism is an alternative to liberal constitutionalism, and while, or unfortunately, in Central Europe, its nationalist form has been spread. In the USA, there is a progressive direction of uh, populist constitutionalism. For example, uh, I don't know whether you, you uh, heard about him, Mark Tashnet, a very famous Harvard constitutional lawyer, Harvard University. He himself uh, uh, keep uh, populist constitution, the, the, the attempts of populist constitutionalism. Because they, they emphasize that as the future or its um, improvement of democracy, a, a greater or deeper involvement or in, of ordinary people in the public decision making process. So it, it, it is an improvement of democracy, but it's really hard to, to accept in this region where nationalist populism seems to be spreading. Uh, another one, another famous um, theory illiberal democracy theory or illiberal constitutionalism. There was a study a couple of years ago and the book written by a Polish, uh, uh, Polish scholar Agnieszka Bianca-Cella and the Hungarian one, uh, Timia Drinoci, uh, who um, invented or who introduced this new uh, concept, illiberal uh, According to them, illiberal constitutionalism is as a particular phase in the process of democratic decay uh, or the backsliding from liberal constitutionalism towards an authoritarian regime. So to an extent, it, seem, it, it resembles to, to the hybrid regimes or the description of the hybrid regimes in which the political power weakens the rule of law, democracy, and human rights in particularly sensitive matters at least. Um, institutionalizes populist nationalism. Nevertheless, constitutional democracy still operates in these states, so they allege uh, that uh, still operates in these states, but its formal hallmarks are stronger than, than its substantive principles. Okay, the next one, so-called autocratic legalism, which has been um, 
said or, or elaborated by Kimlin Chapelle, uh, a famous uh, uh, Princeton professor. Um, according to her approach, uh, the state has been captured by autocrats, so she uh, openly uh, um, talk about autocrats like Kaczynski or Orban and, and some, some others who use constitutionalism and democracy simply to dismantle them. You know, so and, and the new autocrats are not only exploiting mistrust, mistrust of public institutions, but are attacking the basic principles of liberal constitutionalism. And uh, so, you know, the, the old story with new instruments. So there are no tanks on the streets. There is no uh, force, police force, military force against the, uh, the opposition. But institutional, formally, uh, democratic institutions are used to dismantle the whole system of separation of powers and the rule of law. There is a quite similar, but again, very famous theory about so-called abusive, abusive constitutionalism, which uh, uh, says that the use of the mechanisms of constitutional change, including the formal and informal constitutional changes, that is constitutional amendments, and informal changes, uh, to undermine democracy. So the the, uh, the objective is the same, to undermine democracy, to destroy the democratic institutional system by formally, expressly or explicitly with constitutional uh, instruments by or through constitutional amendments, uh, constitutional replacement according to uh, David London's terminology. And modern authoritarian regimes use constitutional tools, but in doing so, they abuse constitution making to create constitutional orders in which their political aspirations can be achieved more, much more easily than before. Um, well, I believe maybe, but it's only my subjective evaluation, maybe the most vivid uh, controversy in this area of the mainstream academy Constitutional scholarship is whether the authoritarian, illiberal, or populist constitutionalism is an oxymoron or it is a real and usable analytical framework or terminology that we should use. Um, the two sides are represented very uh, renowned uh, scholars. Gabor Halmai, he's a Hungarian, but Today, he is the, uh, the, um, the chair of the Comparative Constitutional Department at the EUI in Florence, while Mark Tashnet is a Harvard uh, professor. Um, according to Halmai, uh, I, I know both of them, but, but, okay, got, but nice people, anyway. <laughs> so, illiberal populist constitutionalism is an oxymoron. Uh, do you know what is oxymoron? So it's, okay, oxymoron, a contradiction in itself. Uh, an oxymoron because constitutionalism as such can be liberal. Because if the main feature of constitutionalism is the legally limited power of government, then those regimes which deny, which refuse the, any, any limitation of the uh, governmental will cannot be uh, constitutionalists. So, uh, so do, do you understand this? So, so those who reject, simply reject any limitation or restriction of, of uh, governmental power, or political power, or deny the very idea of, in this way, in fact, they deny the core value of constitutionalism. And other scholars consider constitutionalism in a more formalistic way. More formalistic. For example, Tashnet says that illiberal constitutionalism is a rational uh, and plausible terminology. Just his, his famous example is that just take uh, an example of a country which is uh, which is extremely uh, divided from because several different. Uh, um, 
so, so ethnically uh, divided country where the, the peace is kept by dividing the public power between the representatives of the several different ethnics. You know, uh, it is not a liberal, liberal solution be because it ignores the complete equality, but it, uh, it, uh, uh, um, it shares the power between the different uh, national nationalities and ethnic groups. You know, so that would be, or that could be an example for the uh, relevance of illiberal constitutionalism. Um, so the real, real difference between these two camps, these, these two uh, theoretical directions is that while the first, Harmony and others, uh, consider constitutionalism uh, filled by several different principles, mature, let's say material principles like respect for fundamental rights and so on and so on. The uh, other scholars uh, consider this concept in a very formalistic sense. In this sense, in, the, in this latter sense, even the Nazi Germany could be uh, considered as a as a uh, as a rule of law country, as long as there was a legal system which was uh, followed and or, or or enforced, you know. But it's a very extremely formalistic view of constitutionalism or or the rule of law. Okay, and I'm approaching the final part of the presentation. The question is how to restore the rule of law. If we accept the basic statement or presumption that there have been many uh, different kinds of violate, rule of law violations in these two, two countries. Let me concentrate only on Hungary, uh, okay? But it can be maybe uh, illuminating for, for a Polish audience. And let me jump to the uh, pre-election period, okay, just before this, this April, because there were so great expectations to defeat the Orban government in the next general elections in, in April of this year. Um, so that was the basic claim and basic expectation. I referred earlier to the fact that the Hungarian parliamentary election uh, opposition, sorry, opposition is extremely fragmented. There were six different small minor parties uh, in a hostile relationship with each other, but they uh, made an alliance because um, the, uh, in, in Hungary there's uh, a mixed electoral system, which means that uh, well, almost the half of the MPs are elected uh, according to the uh, majority system, that is uh, single in the single uh, candidates uh, uh, are in, in single electoral wards, and there's a proportional system. The, the other uh, half of MPs are elected according to to uh, uh, proportional system. So the uh, target or the intention was to stand up only one opposition candidate against the Fidesz candidate in each electoral ward. That's why there was an alliance. No, 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 no. Yeah, here are only five, but anyway, six <laughs> opposition parties. They uh, made an agreement to, 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 uh, to deal uh, an agreement for, for alliance against, against Fidesz. So that was the, uh, the basic intention. Um, at the same time, on and off, such opinion emerged that the opposition parties should boycott the, uh, the general elections for or because of the lack of fairness, because of the lack of equal chances to win the general elections. But the party leaderships immediately refused this this uh, this claim or this proposal. Um, okay, so there was one option, an allied 
opposition goes to, to election against Fidesz. And in this case, the next, the next question to be answered was how to restore constitutionalism, how to, how to restore the system of the rule of law in the case if the opposition will win the general elections. Because everybody knew that even if the opposition will win the elections, they won't have two-thirds majority in parliament, which is needed for, for, constitution, uh, for constitutional amendments or adopting the new constitutions. So that was the basic paradox, how to restore constitutionalism by ignoring constitutional rules. So how can you change the, the existing constitution if you don't have enough majority in parliament to do so? And in this situation, one of my colleagues in the, and all the retired colleagues anyway, in the, uh, at my own institute, is a very nice guy indeed, an ex uh, 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 member of the Constitutional Court, said that it might be constitutional if the new parliament, even the, the, uh, the new majority, will not be enough or sufficient to modify the Constitution, the fundamental law today, because the new fundamental law uh, requires, again, the two-thirds parliament majority to adopt uh, any constitutional amendment. Just it would be legal, or I, I would say rather that it would be legitimate if the new majority, if the new parliament at its inaugural meeting, that is its first meeting, would declare that the constitutional bodies like constitutional court, Supreme Court, haven't fulfilled their constitutional functions. That's why the parliament takes over their function or their functions to restore or in order to restore the rule of law. And simple majority should be enough to eliminate those elements of the constitution or the so-called cardinal laws, uh, parliamentary legislation need, um, claiming a two-thirds majority of, of the MPs present to repair the rule of law. Yeah, so that was, uh, and uh, this man, uh, the younger one is uh, Peter Markisai, the leader of the allied opposition, and he accepted this legal argumentation, which was absurd anyway, anyway you know? So that's why I said that it was a basic paradox, how to restore constitutionalism if we are not able to follow the constitutional rules because just because we don't have enough majority in parliament to amend the constitution. Okay. Nevertheless, I would say that all these ideas and proposals were premature because of the overwhelming victory of Fidesz on the elections. So nobody expected such final result, reaction result. We can say that the uh, authoritarian nationalist populism has won a glorious victory. So what to do if, if this populist party or this populist government has a huge social support? Um, so it's really um, a difficult question and I'm surely will not be able to, to make a satisfying answer to, to it. However, let me have some uh, remarks, some notes about this glorious victory. This was the greatest victory of Fidesz ever, you know? Um, here's the, uh, the glorious speech announcing the uh, election victory by Viktor Orban. So uh, I believe and it might be um, an argument, but only on the, the academic level. I, I mean, in, in uh, not in political scene, but in in academic uh, discourse, that I believe that this election, this glorious election result, uh, is overshadowed by by 
by the circumstances of the elections. And it's, I believe that these are extremely important lessons of the Hungarian situation. Anyway, you can see the, the uh, final result of the um, elections. Um, the uh, orange means where the, the uh, Fidesz candidate won. The red when the opposition won. So Budapest is quite a position anyway. It's an overwhelming victory. Yes, two thirds again, two thirds majority for for Fidesz. Again, since then, this was in April, this April, yeah, three months ago. Since then, there have been two new constitutional amendments. Oh, okay. The first is that there's a which overshadows this glorious victory, election victory is that there was or there has been a huge government dominance of the press. You can see here a very interesting, I don't know, can you see that picture? You know, it shows that the county newspapers uh, were published with the same title page. You know, that's on the same day, showing or illustrating that all of these journals or newspapers are, are in the hands of the Fidesz. So that was central central guidance what to publish on the title page. So it is uh, very good. Uh, so it is not manipulated. It, it is just put together the, the title pages of the county newspapers. So there's the, uh, this dominance comes from the fact that certain or most uh, powerful opposition newspapers or broadcasts or radio, radio stations have been ousted by, by Fidesz, you know, in, in different, using different methods, including market methods for oligarchs, Fidesz or allied oligarchs, uh, uh, both those newspapers then uh, change their orient political orientation towards to, for to, to towards a pro government orientation and so on and so on. Um, to use then another important uh, factor of this glorious victory was that the use of public authorities for political purposes of the government. This man is uh, today already not was the president of the. Uh, Anyway, Laszlo Domokos was uh, the chairman of the state audit office, which is, which should be a quite particularly neutral uh, controlling institute, you know, controlling the use of public uh, funds, public finance, budgetary funds, and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, any, anyway this, uh, the, the state audit office imposed very bad fines on the opposition parties just shortly before the general elections, depriving them from their money, their material instruments. Then there were uh, many so-called bogus parties, you know, not real parties, bogus parties. This man is one of the richest Hungarian, <laughs> Hungarian uh, Gatyan, got rich in porn industry anyway. He had some tensions with, with the government earlier, just before, three months before the general elections, he established a new party. He spent a lot of money for, for campaigning, just, you know, to, to make the opposition side more fragmented. So uh, on paper or theoretically, he was opposition, but actually, the only function of this bogus party was to to get some opposition votes, you know, uh, uh, taken away for, from the, the the real opposition parties. Another and and the government propaganda. So as as I said earlier, public media has been parked uh, or was parked at the very first days of the new government after 2010. It's extremely like in the uh, under the communism in the 50s. So the style communication style is, is awful indeed. Okay, so that was I, I believe that when we are thinking about how to restore the rule of law in these countries, that was the uh, the first option. That is the domestic or national level. How to change the system from inside? 
not not the system, but you know, that's how to restore constitutionalism and the rule of law. So I would say that after such elections, there is no any any hope or chance that the rule of law can be restored from at the, at the domestic level, at, at the national level. What can be the other option? The other option can be the European dimension. When the EU makes uh, it makes pressure on 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 the uh, black sheep member states to restore the uh, the uh, rule of law. But here is against uh, basic paradox, namely, can EU subsidies be withheld to enforce the basic values of the the EU, primarily the system of the rule of law? I would say that just a couple of years uh, ago, uh, this idea was completely unimaginable at the European uh, uh, level. Nevertheless, today it seems to me at least that uh, it is or it can be the only effective way to make an influence on, on, on these two countries. In a way, the Polish government has succeeded to make an agreement between the European Union to, to get uh, it's uh, it's a uh, share from the EU Reco recovery fund um, promising certain reforms like as far as I know to abolish the disciplinary chamber but I would say that the disagreement is quite uh, still quite unusual because because in this in this uh, case the European Union set so-called milestones which should be achieved by Poland in order to get the next part of this of the subsidy subsidy and anyway just I I I said that it might be the only effective way to make a real pressure on the member state just because the Orban government itself tries to to get these this uh, this uh, these funds from the EU so so uh, they they want to 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 do anything actually not <laughs> but they promise any any anything to 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 the European Commission just to 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 get the this recovery fund um okay so that that is the uh I don't believe that uh, procedure article 7 can be uh, fruitful at all. Uh, that's the nuclear option. But conditional procedure, conditional procedures, possibilities are also limited because it relates only to to guarantee the regular and legitimate use of the EU funds. Nothing more, you know. So uh, that's strange situation. Finally, lessons. Uh, it is really hard to to say any. And a lesson um, in particular from from the Hungarian case, but still, let me try just say three different uh, possible lessons. So the first is that the institutional and procedure guarantees are important. Uh, seemingly, it is quite in conflict with what I have said earlier, uh, at least as far as Hung uh, the Hungar Hung Hungarian cases concerned because we may have reservations about this because the authority, as I said, authoritarian governments uh, can effectively use the existing institutions for their own purposes, for political gains. Uh, but just this shows for me that how important it is to preserve the original, uh, original autonomy and independence of the of public institutions, in particular countervailing or controlling institutions. At the same time, another lesson can be that even these institutional procedure guarantees are not sufficient to, to defend the rule of law and constitutional democracy. You know, there is another um, famous article written by an American scholar said about so-called sham constitutions who argues so that in these countries, even though these institutions are working, are existing, like in any other European, in, in any other consolidated democracies, uh, these are sham institutions or bogus institutions, which function not, which follow not really their original functions or constitutional functions, but 
only they want to keep the appearance of democratic rules of games, you know? So it, it is sure that institution, th these guarantees are not enough, are not sufficient, because if their leadership is replaced, if particularly committed people are put in the leading positions, even those institutions which formerly have the which are formerly most powerful ones cannot do cannot reach any any real change or cannot counter balance the, the, the executive power. And it is my favorite anyway, my favorite lesson that is the constitution of culture. You know, it was very um, illustrating, it was very important for me when I heard that here, even the judges uh, held public demonstrations, because it, it, is, a, it is an evidence of, of kind of, of constitutional culture. You know, in the, during the 90s, Hungary was a model country of the new democracies. It was the, uh, sometimes it is uh, uh, called legal constitutionalism, you know, when the uh, controlling institutions almost more powerful than the political majoritarian institutions. So there were the, the, the Hungarian constitutionalism can comprise all important institutions and procedures. We had everything for um, parliamentary ombudsman, constitutional court, and so on and so on. And still, these were not, not enough because the constitutional culture, that is the people's commitment to constitutional values, haven't proved to be strong enough. That made, made it possible that the populist party just captured the whole, whole state and introduced a semi-authoritarian system. That is my last lesson. And Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I, I will try to, to make an answer to so you. Thank you, Center, for this uh, lecture. And are there any questions? Sure. So, business. So, uh, so, thank you for the lecture. Uh, in the beginning and in the end, you briefly mentioned about the uh, the uh, less commitment to, to protest of uh, judges in the theory. Can yeah. you tell us more, or maybe could you explain us the reason why judges in the Hungary are, are afraid to protest or to express uh, their opinions about the uh, failure of constitutional rights uh, in the Hungary? Yeah. Just right, no? Yeah, you know, the, um, the judicial corps is much uh, lesser uh, or smaller uh, in Hungary than in Poland. It means that in Hungary there are uh, less than 3,000 3, uh, judges. You know, I would say that when, as I said earlier, uh, about 10% of the old judges or acting judges were uh, uh, dismissed from their positions, it was a great threat. It was a message to all judges that it can happen anything in this country, you know? So I, I, I would say very simply, the judges have been intimidated by this government. You know, uh, new, you know, the, uh, I said that the technique was low, the, the lowering of the compulsory retirement age, which actually means, so the, the final result was that the, the leaderships of, of the county level uh, courthouses were removed, you know, because they were older. So the leaders are, of course, uh, from the, the uh, older judges and they were removed. So the, uh, and the new young Turks, if I can use this, this term, yeah, young Turks got to leading positions. They are more loyal to the government, not politically, you know, but to, to the whole system. And, um, this guy, you know, at the very beginning of my presentation, I showed her this uh, Andras Vargasi, who is the uh, uh, the president of the Curia, is quite loyal. 
His first deputy is another, another Fidesz uh, sympathizer, mm -hmm. or sympath uh, Fidesz ally, you know? So there's a strong, strong leadership. There is a new policy, judicial policy to introduce the so-called moderated or half precedent system into the Hungarian legal system, which is quite strange because it's a civil law system, you know? Mm -hmm. In, in formal education, in, in, in the jurisprudence of ordinary uh, judges, it's quite a strange thing that the precedents. The only thing is to, to provide the central management how to adjudicate the different cases. The, this moderate uh, precedent system would mean that each individual court have to follow the uh, central decisions of, this, of the courier, you know? So it is my simple answer that the whole judicial corp corpse has been intimidated, like the constitutional court, so not today because these are Fidesz fans, but a, a little bit earlier, you know, in Romania, when uh, President Bas ba Basescu threatened the independence of the constitutional court, that con the Romanian constitutional court announced or spread uh, protesting manifest Stations, it is quite unimaginable in, in Hungary. So maybe I will ask the next question because I have many questions, but not. Yeah, but I overstep <laughs> my line. I'm sorry for that. No, we have uh, 30 minutes for discussion, so we have much time. Uh, but no, sorry, <laughs> we don't have so much time. But okay, uh, to be precise, uh, because I've heard that there is another difference between Poland and Hungary, very important in my opinion, the strength of private liberal media. And um, as you, as you uh, told us, the public propaganda making media is quite similar. But uh, I think maybe the action of against liberal media uh, are different. Because uh, as you may heard last year and this year also, we had extremely important debate uh, about destroying or limiting TVN, the best liberal uh, station, TV station in Poland. And I've heard quite similar case of Club Radio, Club Radio in uh, Budapest in, uh, in Hungary. So uh, in Poland, we have uh, we had a great pressure on the president. So president, um, th this pressure was so strong that president introduced it, uh, a veto procedure, and uh, this law is not uh, not uh, here under the debate anymore. But uh, in Hungary, as well as I heard, um, this uh, problem with lack of private liberal strong media are much more worse. So could you elaborate more about this today's private media situation on Hungary? And uh, in your opinion, is it an important um, question uh, for the rule of law of the rule of law perspective or is it not really? Okay, yes. Um, Club Radio, yes, that was a great scandal, but uh, three or four years ago, the, the, uh, the biggest opposition newspaper was also abolished, Nape Sabachak, that was the uh, most popular uh, daily newspaper in, in, in Hungary. And the, uh, the two uh, most widespread um, internet newspapers, Index and Origo, uh, were taken over by, by the government or subverted to the government. It, yeah, you know. At first sight, it's really hard to understand these developments because um, these are private companies. These were private companies. How to change their political orientation? Uh, but Hungary is a very small country. The uh, it is really important for any broadcast, any any uh, media uh, outlets for, for for getting advertisements. You know, as a revenue. But in Hungary, the government and governmental advertisements had much greatest share in, in, in this, this uh, market, you know. And simply, the opposition, opposition newspapers, radio stations, and so on, uh, do not get any, any ad advertisement from, from the government. That, that's why I would say that there is maybe an uh, informal prohibition to do to do so to give any advertise to publish any advertisement in an opposition newspaper 
you know that's why they they are desperately uh, needed for for money from capital from outer capital and at this point steps in the story the oligarchs fides oligarchs who buy these newspapers you know and that, that and and okay and uh, there is a very interesting evidence for for the whole movement and the whole story do, do you know this this development that we don't have enough money we desperately need government or public advertisement and so on and so if under such circumstances you know even private companies are quite reluctant to give advert to publish advertisement in opposition newspapers because maybe i will not have in this case more governmental work and and, and procurements so they are very careful to do so that's why these uh, uh outlets media outlets were open to toward to get in external capital and many of them were just by by uh, oligarchs or fidesz allies and that is um the whole hidden procedure was was um made uh, public when more than 400 individual media outlets newspapers in the whole country gave their their uh newspapers stations etc etc what they offered to a foundation you know and uh, uh, freely so they resigned their own property they gave gave them to to this foundation or not foundation but uh, but uh, corporate corporation cashmo that is the uh, the name of it where whose whose management consists of of fidesz politicians and fidesz was so you know that was a completely irrational step for example it means that i'm for, <laughs> i'm not but if i i were a fidesz oligarch you know very close political ally of, of this government i would win many public procurements okay i would be the beneficiary of this system okay i would buy an opposition newspaper for i don't know one billion foreign and yet for it okay i began i start to to run this newspaper or this radio station yes but after two months i would resign from from this outlet i would offer it quite freely to another company this cash more than 400 Hungarian businessmen re resigned their own property and offered the, offered them to to cash in. That that's the uh, that's the result. Because Cashma manages all of these all of these more than four hundred outlets and newspapers. So that's the central man, as if they were communists. So did suppose the 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 method of of under communism thank you very much so this uh, quote that warsaw follows budapest is true in another um, issue because in poland we also have quite similar mechanism with uh, newspapers because uh, cao of Orlen, the biggest yeah. yes gas company and oil company also bought the little newspapers to control them and to uh, make them more a uh, fan of uh, the law and justice party the same and uh, the same mechanism uh, but thank you very much for uh, answering this question are there any questions from the yes you were family you were first yes uh, thank you uh, all the things are, are very sad uh, yeah. and pessimistic yeah we see uh, the differences between the situation in Poland and Hungary. Uh, but I wonder, can you explain this? What do you think that Polish uh, constitutional uh, tribunal uh, said that the treaty with the 
priority rule is unconstitutional. And uh, while the Hungarian uh, Constitutional Court uh, avoided uh, yeah. such, uh, it is because uh, Polish uh, tribunal is so brave or it is not so smart. Or on the other hand, it's, it's not so brave. Yeah. So after just immediately after the uh, not December. Not yeah, yeah, I know. So just Im immediately after the judgment of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal yeah, last December, uh, Judith Farga, the uh, Minister of Justice, uh, submitted a petition to the Hungarian Constitutional Court. I believe that with the, with the intention to to do the same. That is to follow that decision, the Polish decision, um, at the migration case, in, in relation migration case. Uh, but the Hungarian Constitution Court uh, yet hasn't followed in this case the Polish example. But the, the Constitution Court tried anyway from professional view, or in my view, the Hungarian decision is awful, so poor, very wrong. So the the I, I mean the legal reasoning of that decision. So it, it is uh, embarrassing, really. So, um, but this, the the point is that according to Constitution Court, although the Hungarian government, who who was the petitioner in this case, is right. So the government's position is right, but still. This court doesn't have the power to to overrule the EU legal acts, you know. So it was a, a manifesto of loyalty towards the government, but still the constitutional court didn't dare to to step the same as as the uh, its fellow institution also did. So, uh, but still, anyway, the constitutional court is, you know, uh, the whole petition shows or illustrates that Hungarian Constitution Courts have has been an instrument in the hands of the government in many other cases. You know, for example, when in, in uh, there was a, a, a sharp dis dispute between the European Commission and Hungary in uh, uh, during the mi migration crisis in 2015. And the Hungarian government at that point, at that time, there was not a two thirds majority. One, one MP was missing from that majority. And the Hungarian government <clears throat> submitted to a, a proposal for a constitutional amendment in, in Hungarian parliament to inscribe into the constitutional text the constitutional identity of this country, that Hungary is for us. And we ourselves want to do, want to decide with whom we want to live together. So that, that was very shortly, that that would be uh, the Hungarian constitutional identity, but there was not um, enough majority to do so. So it was not adopted by, the, it was adopted, but not by the requ required majority by parliament. Okay, no problem. The constitutional court in the next year, take a decision that it is the constitutional identity in Hungary, although constitutional identity at that time was not mentioned in, in the constitutional text. So it, it was that the constitutional court is sometimes handled as, a, as an instrument. But in this, I believe that it was an uh, institutional interest to, to hold up the appearance that it is a real constitutional court. But anyway, the, the whole <laughs> Uh, text of the judicial reasoning that, that is the argumentation of the constitutional court decision is, is emphasizing that the government is right anyway, but unfortunately we don't have the power to overrule the EU legal actions. And so, Mr. Uh, Mr. Professor, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, of course, it was uh, not optimistic, but uh, but I think that uh, you gave us a wider view of. What's, what's going on, what, what happens, to, and what will be possibly in Poland, because uh, as, we, as we told that uh, 
we had that feeling that uh, also copy would be good. Yes, it had. Uh, but I would like to ask you about the uh, two things uh, I think somehow related to the topic of your lecture. Uh, the first thing is uh, the historical constitution. Uh, I about it uh, also because uh, it's really hard to understand what it's uh, it, what is it exactly. I tried several times to read some some yeah. papers about it, and I still have that feeling that. I don't know what's going on with, with this, uh, with this, uh, uh, you know, with this uh, concept. And the second is uh, the, uh, the very specific situation in uh, Hungary that uh, uh, another concept uh, of uh, uh, constitutional identity is written into the constitution. Yeah. And uh, then the final question. Are those uh, concepts somehow are used in public debate uh, against the rule of law? Okay. Uh, I, I must say that these are very relevant issues. We are working on, on how, to, how to answer this. Yes, um, the point is that the, the preamble which is called national evolval, it's Hungarian fundamental, law. that's constitutional preamble, says that the constitutional, I, 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 sorry, let, let me just you know, combine the two questions because these are sure. strongly interconnected issues. So the Hungarian constitutional identity is based on, on a historical constitution on the one side, on the Christian culture of the country on the, on the other side. And, uh, and Article R in the constitutional text says that when interpreting the constitutional text, the preamble and the so-called achievements of the historical constitution are respected. And since then, every constitutional lawyer <laughs> Uh, have thinking about what what does it mean? Because historical constitution is uh, that's my view because I it's one of my favorite uh, research era, you know, Hungarian historical I, I, constitution. I don't get it. Yeah, because it it is quite un understandable even oh. for for Hungarians, you know. Because anyway, I believe that it, what I'm going to say it's quite ridiculous. According to the official approach, Hungarian historical constitution is a, is a so-called 1,000 year old constitution, beginning with the, the foundation of the Hungarian state by <laughs> St. Stephen in 1,000, a, a written, uh, unwritten constitution, which was valid until, was in effect until the end of the Second World War. Which means that according to the official opinion, the, the historical constitution has a 1,000 year past. The, it would be a problem in itself. That, okay, it, it means that the feudal Hungary in the medieval time, Hungary after the uh, civic revolution in uh, 1849, uh, Hungarian. Uh, conservative era in the interwar period between the two world wars, having with completely different systems, you know. So how to 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 catch the uh, real content of historical constitution? But, but there there was an, a narrowing provision, which has made an even greater uh, confusion, you know, saying that not 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 the whole of historical constitution should be respected, but only the achievements of the historical constitution. Okay, so it, it was completely unknown term or concept in Hungarian legal history or constitutional history. It is very, it is a newly created terms, you know. And if we take a look at the jurisprudence, the relevant jurisprudence of the constitution court, this embarrassment is growing because the Constitution Court used to refer to the history, the achievements of the historical court 
accidentally, sporadically. You know, there is no any logic. So if uh, the Constitutional Court wants to back up its actual occasional decision, just refers to the historical constitution. But there is no any inherent logic in, in, in which cases on what kind of basis can we use the historical constitution. So it is a, a great bluff, I, I believe. So uh, it may be um, an instrument, what well, it was intended to give an instrument to, to, the, to the loyal constitutional court to, to, the, to make any decision what, what is favorable for, for the government, you know, because it is a, a usable thing without any, any, any real, real content. So is it a problem if we prolong five minutes? No, 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 no. Oh, but, but, uh, sorry, just, just uh, a last one. Uh, this, uh, the whole concept, mm -hmm. including the constitutional identity mm -hmm. and the historical constitution, uh, have been used so far against the Brussels, against the European Union, not in, in rule of law cases. But you know, this undefined concept hangs over like a uh, sword of Damocles. So at any time, it can be used against rule of law aspirations. So the last question, because. Yes, uh, excuse me. I heard that uh, some ethnic groups like, for example, gypsies are discriminated uh, in Hungary based on their uh, nationality in terms of social, social services. Uh, how is this described by the government as legal? Is this historical constitutional argumentation used to uh, legalize it? No, there is no such direct connection between the two things. So the, that is uh, when I, I refer to the discrimination against uh, minority groups, I think primarily on the LGBTQ groups. There is a very fierce governmental campaign against homosexual and lesbian people, you know, and the, against, so the, the, for example, uh, uh, at the universities, gender studies as a subject, uh, has been prohibited in state universities, you know, because there's a, a great campaign against gender studies, transgender people, there is the uh, declining West, you know. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the discrimination of Roma people it has a great, uh, has a long tradition and past in, in Hungary, unfortunately. It, there, there's no, uh, maybe in it doesn't emerge at, at the uh, uh, government propaganda directly, only indirectly. For example, there was uh, that Hungary have lost a number of cases before the Strasbourg court because of the treatment of prisoners. And those people, those prisoners, for example, they, they, the the uh, the uh, prisoner cells are too small, small you know, for for many peoples who are kept there, and the uh, these peoples uh, have uh, had um, got um, compensations for these smart treatments, and you know the uh, the population of prisoners are in great. Uh, um, I don't know the the exact numbers, but there is a high proportion of gypsy people. And, uh, and there was again a governmental campaign and a new legislation which want to deprive these people from, from their legitimate compensation. And you're saying that, what a thing, it is shocking that these, these uh, wrongdoing people, these, these people uh, uh, got, or sorry, get compensations from, from, from the average people's taxes. You know, so, but, but there is no direct uh, connection between constitutional identity, historical constitution, and the march impact of the gypsy people. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? So maybe I'll ask the one last question. We're uh, <laughs> prolonging, prolonging, but uh, I cannot uh, limit it myself. Because uh, once I've read a very uh, interesting research made by Eurobarometer, it's a foundation of public opinions of European Union. And the Europe was divided on approximately 300 regions, as well as I, as I remember. And the Eurobarometer 
asked about the European's identity of those regions. And the question was, are you more European identity or um, both national and European or more nas national uh, identity? And in uh, 299 regions, the citizens asked was were both national and European or only national identity. But there were one region, one only, and it was very interesting to me, uh, where people answered that there are more Europeans, that their identity is more European than the nation, and it was the, the city of Budapest. So uh, my question is, uh, maybe, uh, because I'm referring to, to this uh, glorious, as you said, the victory of uh, Mr. Orban, uh, maybe, as you, as you, um, I'm very curious about your opinion about this. Maybe if it is more cultural identity differences, more cultural identity conflict, because um, every other region of uh, Hungary, uh, uh, citizens of this, those regions were on the side of national identity, historical identity. So maybe more conflict is somehow connected with more support to populists centralists, uh, quasi autocrats. Maybe it is uh, maybe resolving this conflict or making it more uh, cruel, making more uh, more hard is the way to uh, lesser to to make the populists uh, power lesser. Yes, you know there is a basic uh, uh, correlation in Hungary. Um, the smaller a village. The greater the popular support of Fidesz has. Uh, just reverse, reversing this this uh, correlation in 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 the, in the greatest cities, uh, the opposition would have a majority. Like I show show you the uh, the uh, final results in Budapest, where almost all the uh, electoral wards uh, uh, were won by by uh, the opposition. Um, candidate. So I would say that the uh, the, the great in, in greater cities, the, this Fidesz-like nationalism is refused. <laughs> but, but the problem is that we have only one really great city, Budapest, with 1.7 million people, and there are only five or six uh, cities uh, having uh, more population than one. Hundred thousand people, you know. So, um, but still, uh, for for the whole, so exploring it for in, in the whole population, the European Union has still uh, a great support, even though the uh, continuous government propaganda is against the Brussels. You know, so Brussels is the reason for the evil, evil thing. I don't know. So, uh, it might give some some hope for for the future you know so uh i don't see there is a great support of the european union that's the uh there's i i i see also that there is uh some contradiction between the the, the extreme support of of this populist party and at the same time the great support of the european union you know so yeah thank you very much professor and uh, please uh, applause for the second. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I maybe you could say I just suggest suggested you to some some further readings and let me uh, draw your attention on the, the, the last one, which will be um, published maybe the next or after the next issue of the international. Of, International Journal of Constitutional Law, just because it deals this article deals with the um, uh, with this kind of comparison between the Hungarian and, and Polish situation. Some of you can just take a look at that article. 